hello, hello. Okay, recording is in progress, which means hopefully you can all hear me. Um, thanks for tuning in, friends and followers. It's Wednesday, which means it's not only hump day, but it's time for another rich edition of Wellness Wednesday. Um, I always like to start with talking about the weather because I'm a Minnesotan and you guys are probably Minnesotans too, and that's just how we communicate. But as I don't evidence this morning, you know, temps were clocking in the mid to late forties and it just goes to show that we are on the precipice of fall people. Um, to some, including myself, this is a bit of a relief. Um, to others, it does have a tendency to kind of bring a dull knot to the stomach because you know, what's around the corner. Um, but one thing that I think we can all agree on is that wellness is more top of mind um, than ever. You know, big seasonal swings in temperature can leave a real impact on our bodies. The return of dry air, it does a real number on our sinus passages, as we can all attest to. It's back to school time for all the kiddos out there, um, back to in-person work for many of us. And with all of our competing priorities, you know, we do have one to do that remains unchanged and that's try not to get sick. <laughs> um, obviously we only have so much control with that when we have to re-enter society or we're in the same environment as someone that is re-entering society, but it's important um, for us to have as many tools in our preventative toolbox as possible when peak flu, common cold, and COVID season um, was upon us, or as the mainstream medical community coins it, the twindemic. Um, so today's topic is all about touch therapy, as you know. And while we are not here to make claim that modalities like acupuncture and massage therapy and chiropractic care can be a cure-all or be the resolve for immune system deficiencies getting worked on, um, it does support main functions that lead to whole body health, which in turn keeps our immune system operating smoothly and efficiently. Um, it's all interconnected as natural health has taught us. So our session for today, Touch Therapy as Immune Boosters, was inspired by an article that we produced um, earlier this year that one of our panelists sourced um, for us. And it, it, it attempts to kind of buck the, the long-standing perceptions of massage therapy, you know, uh, modalities like that have largely been reserved as solutions for pain problems or methods of self-care, you know, but they're, it's also great for preventative methods since massage and of course, Accu and Cairo, that all gets the blood pumping. You know, you don't need to have something hurt to get these therapies. They have properties that attribute to greater physical health, mental health, and emotional health. Um, touch starvation, which we'll learn more about shortly here, that's kind of become its own brand of epidemic as some of the practitioners at the school um, have said in the past. And it's important that we, but especially our older generations, you know, try to stay ahead of that. So I will let today's guests kind of drill that down in a more eloquent, educated way. But before we get started, I do want to just send a quick shout out to our friends at Northwestern Health Sciences University. They sponsor um, the Wellness Wednesday series. We've been partnering with them on our editorial content since the beginning of 2018. So it's been very advantageous to put faces to the names of these experts that we've been using for our um, expanding roster of articles. Um, Michelle uh, is a chiropractor, Michelle Vincent. She's a chiropractor who practices out of Northwestern's Bloomington Clinic, excuse me, which is open to the public. Um, and she specializes in family practice, pregnancy and pediatrics, chronic pain and headaches, and, and so much more. Um, lower back pain as well. That's, that's kind of a biggie. And then Sarah Weaver is an, ac excuse me, an acupuncturist and a massage therapist, um, also practices out of the Bloomington Clinic. She specializes in headaches and migraine, 
neck pain, concussion, chronic pain, massage for the medically complex, oncology massage, and, uh, and so much more. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to them. Um, but really quick, sorry, one quick housekeeping item. Be sure that you drop all of your questions or your comments in the Q&A box. We will do our best to make sure that we've touched on all of those throughout the course of the next 50 minutes. So, um, okay, let's get started. Sarah, Michelle, how are you two? Hello. Hi, there's two oh. people. I'm not sure yet if you're going to be able to see me, but we're yeah, trying. That's okay. So just to let the audience know, Michelle, there's she's officing out of the clinic and you're in an area where the internet isn't really doing so great. So we might just do audio with her. Oh, which kind can of you a, see me yet or no? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, let's see. So... Okay, well, while you're still troubleshooting, Michelle, Sarah, do you just kind of want to give an introduction to the followers? Um, just get them up to speed, you know, on where you're from and kind of where that led you to in um, your job role today as it stands. Well, um, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, but I uh, moved to Minnesota in 1991. Uh, my first winter here was the the famous Halloween snowstorm year. Welcome to Minnesota. And and the thing people don't talk about um, that amazes me because I'm not from here uh, is that it plummeted to ten below <laughs> um, for like a week afterwards. And I was like, hello. Yeah, yeah. First week of November, right after that. But anyway. Um, so shortly after I uh, moved to Minnesota, I went to uh, massage school. Um, I, I have two creative writing degrees, actually, one from the University of Minnesota, one from uh, Oberlin College in Ohio. So I came here via the Ohio. Um, and um, I wanted to have a skill that, that like people might, might, might want that could, could help support me as a writer. Um, and it sort of took over my life. Like, like I um, just, I've, I've been doing massage now for 28 years. Um, it's one of my favorite things. Um, and people always ask me, oh, do you use your creative writing degrees? And I'm like, I use them all the time because I'm a, a part of healthcare, being a healthcare provider is communicating. And people are always telling me, oh, you're so good at explaining these really complicated health things in a way I understand. So, so that's, I think, a, a, something that sort of unifies a lot of the things I do is, and, and really touch is, is just another form of communication. Um, and our bodies take communication in, in many sensory ways. It's not just verbal. I mean, we're, we're, we're communicating with each other all the time in various ways. And, and um, human beings can't function without touch. Um, there's a lot of research. The most famous stuff are some of the infant massage therapy research or actually even um, some of the earliest research on touch physiologically are these famous rat pup studies that where psychology professors somewhere in some lab were like stimulating little baby rats with little paint brushes to see like what does what does a, a mother rat do when it's licking its its babies and they understand from the, all that research and they still do these studies like there's hundreds of them um, that physiologically mammals do not normally develop without touch so that that's true for people and it's true for every every other mammal you could think of, um, but that sort of leads me to our topic of touch deprivation, which um, is something really that was a thing before the COVID. Like like there's all kinds of populations that get reduced touch. Um, single people, people as they age, if if people are not really connected into family um, closely or to community. Um, a lot of elderly people just stop getting touched. You know, if a partner has passed away, 
um, or people are living very far from their children. They're just not getting those 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 community right. connections. Right, right. Um, and when and, our communication sense is dull, that seems to have sort of a a ripple effect on the functionalities of the human body. Isn't that right? I thought I read mm -hmm. that. Yeah. As you lose your hearing or as you lose your eyesight, like that isn't like a localized challenge that actually has like cognitive implications. Um, because oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, I am going to just turn it over to Michelle really quick if she's still here. Um, and Michelle, if you're still here, maybe uh, say hi. <laughs> Give us awesome. Time. I think I'm unmuted. I think it, did oh, that work? Can okay. you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. And actually you had your video feature on and it was perfect. I don't, do you want to try that again? I think you have to send me the opening. I don't think I can do it from here. There we go. Host, start my video. I think this might work. Oh, it, uh, there you are. <laughs> hello everyone. <laughs> Okay, Michelle, without further ado, I mean, way to make an entrance. You want to just, um, same as with Sarah, who gave us an incredible introduction and found a way to connect writing with massage therapy in the most eloquent way I've ever heard in my life. Um, do you want to just kind of give us a, a brief rundown of what got you into this field and where things are at today, where your job role stands in um, the current climate? Absolutely. She's a tough act to follow, though. So <laughs> I, I, this is actually chiropractic is a second career for me. So I was in marketing prior to that and just wanted to do things for other people and do more and help other people the best I could. And unfortunately, at the same time, I was thinking about this. My mother ended up with cancer. And so as I watched her go through all the treatment and the struggles and the doctor's appointments, four and a half years before she passed away and saw just to how sad it is that they spend such little time with people, doctors, MDs, and not that they aren't needed. We definitely need them and they can do so much. But after a while, it, she felt like she was kind of a number. And I thought, no, I had a chiropractor and I always felt good leaving. And I thought there's, there's gotta be a better way to take care of people. So he always said, you have really good hands. I think you'd make a good chiropractor. So I, I kind of like hem hot around for a couple of years. And after my father passed away, it's funny how after you lose people, how you really rethink your, what you're doing in your life, I thought, he always had a passion for his career, and I wanted that. I thought, what I'm doing right now, I cannot do till I'm 67 and a half, <laughs> so I might as well go back to school. I'm going to be 39 regardless if I yeah. go through this program when I graduate, so that was my lead into that, and I also have a certificate in acupuncture that I also uh, received here at Northwestern, uh, but I really, I can't say enough. I think all the practitioners here have the best job ever. We see so much change in people and this has gotten, you're right, such a hot topic that it's been interesting for me to see how we had it, just like Sarah was saying, and I saw it a lot with elderly people and you just knew they were lonely. They hadn't really had anybody checking in on them. They hadn't probably been hugged forever. And this was just kind of like a normal thing. And they'd want to spend lots of time with you and really could feel the difference when we would actually work on them. So from muscle tightness to relaxation, calmer breathing, mood increases as far as positivity. And so now, unfortunately, as we've seen with the pandemic, we've gone really where this has gone to involve all ages. And it right. calls for kids yeah. all the way up from the right. lack of social, the lack of touch, the lack of hugs, uh, you know, from the teachers even to the, to the little students. And it's really sad because it does really create a whole host of issues and concerns, a lot of health concerns. Right. Um, that's a very impactful origin story as well. <laughs> Michelle, you two are making me feel like uh, all of your faculty make me feel like, gosh, there's just... 
you know, their life doesn't follow like this solitary line in a way. I feel like we not to get all philosophical, but I feel like we lead s- several lives in our lifetime, you know, just because we pursue one thing doesn't mean that we have to fulfill that to our dying day. Um, and just, yeah, how beautiful, um, I think the vernacular around touch therapies like chiropractic care and massage therapy, people are starting to understand that they offer such an array of benefits. It's not just a one size thing, you know, it's not just, this is, you know, mediating your chronic pain. It's, it's, um, the touch starvation and everything else that you two touched on. Um, can, can you guys kind of just drill that down for us a little bit more, what touch starvation is? Um, how do we know if we have it? And mm-hmm. at which point should we be, I don't know, concerned about it? Mm-hmm. I think, Sarah, was I taking the first question? <laughs> we were going to yeah, kind of look back ahead. and forth. Start. <laughs> so actually, I, it was great because I went down the rabbit hole as I did even more studying on this the last day and, and middle of the night a little bit. But it is really when a living human being doesn't have either any touch at all from another human being or another living thing, doesn't have to be human, uh, but, or they have very little. So you go from one extreme really to the other, which is what we've seen with social distancing and what we've saw with, you know, masks and all this, the, um, this crazy COVID. So that's kind of the definition. It's either touch deprivation, touch starvation, uh, just like it sounds. You just are not getting that hands-on from anybody or an animal or very, very little. And so I think what your next question, I'm going to just look here real quick. Well, I'm going to just hop in on that. Michelle, I'm thinking about your, um, your job position there. And I guess it's easy to equate something like massage therapy as a means to an end for touch starvation, but how does chiropractic care fall into that? How is that another possible solution for touch deprivation or touch starvation? Mm -hmm. Right. And that is such an excellent question, right along with acupuncture, massage therapy, and many other things that uh, we could add that could help with um, alleviating some of that problem. But with chiropractors, if you haven't been to one or seen one, everything we do is gonna be basically with our hands. From the moment that we start with the exam, the history, we're gonna rule out it being any other type of issue that wouldn't maybe necessarily involve us. And typically headaches, low back pain, muscular pain, skeletal pain, Uh, imbalances in the joints where people are not able to walk well. There's so many little things that can go into it. But when we actually start working on somebody, that's when you see. Once we do the exam, once we've got the history, then we can formulate a treatment plan. And when we do that, then we start into that touch. I personally end up doing a lot of soft tissue. So like Sarah, I kind of incorporate it. We don't necessarily call it massage, but myofascial release. We use trigger point therapy, uh, soft tissue mobilization, and all those things are actually working on the on the patient and touching. And that's before we even get to the adjusting part. <laughs> so then there's always the touch for us in restoring joint motion when we are working with the patient and we, we have felt their entire spine, their neck, so they're getting a lot of that touch too, right? From a real gentle touch. And uh, then we can go right in and move into adjusting the patient. But there's several other modalities that are incorporated because the muscles moves the bone. If the bone has moved and we don't fix that muscle, it's gonna keep pulling things out and where those joints are not gonna be working as well. So all the way around, I think we all have our varying degrees of how we touch and in different ways. One of the things I thought was kind of interesting that I did learn on a study is that if anybody touches a person for even like one, just a little over an inch per second, it automatically starts to stimulate uh, hormones to, to really enforce and kind of what we were saying is how it helps the patient. Um, it's, it's amazing to me actually. So that means somebody in your home 
uh, husband, boyfriend, spouse, whoever, partner, brother, sister, kids, <laughs> the dog, you know, cats, anybody that you're, well, you know, can be right. doing that okay. is almost like the ideal uh, setting to cause all these things to happen. And oh. it's so complicated. And I'm kind of really going to dummy it down and it's not going to sound like I am, but it kind of am. When we do touch people and we are working with trigger points or whatever that is, we are automatically touching nerve fibers and receptors on the body that are made specifically to recognize gentle touch uh, or tactile touch. So that receptor automatically will send a message to the brain and this is I think you alluded a little bit to one of the questions with nervous system and how that is affected with chiropractic care or the immune system and what happens is, is it goes all the way up the brain tells the vagus nerve to kick in and the vagus nerve innervates a lot of our body but it's specifically designed to calm us down it's not that hyped up, I'm scared, we've got to run energy, that fight or fright type of mode. It's completely the opposite. So what happens is that we end up having that kick in, which is fantastic. The vagus nerve will start to promote oxytocin, and that's another hormone. And that hormone will also promote our feel good hormones is what we like to call them. So uh, mm -hmm. our uh, endorphins, serotonin, we get uh, uh, dopamine gets released as well. And so that's where people get that sudden feeling of, oh, that feels so great. Like it, it's almost instantaneously because it, it happens so quick. And that's, you know, a long process and sounds kind of really complicated. And trust me, there's a lot more that goes into that. But when we see that and we do immediately, we can feel and see the patient calm down, relax, slow their breathing. They have deeper breaths, their heart rate. We know we've had a lot of studies. We know that blood pressure gets reduced. Uh, it's just so many amazing things that help with that touch yeah. so that just kind of gives you a short end of how it triggers it but when people start to especially people in pain or severe pain when they can start to calm down and we can get them in that spot then we're able to actually work on them better we're able to do more things if we aren't worried that we're going to increase their pain, we want to make sure that we do everything in those baby steps so that they feel really good, but it allows us to work more with the patient to get them better quicker. Wonderful. Thank you for explaining all of that, Michelle. Um, and it sounds like we're just getting started. Like, I mean, we've, uh, touch has been a form of communication for forever, but we're still kind of learning just on a cellular level, how powerful that is. Um, I have a question for you, Sarah, and I wanted to know um, if you have seen, and Michelle got me thinking about this when she's talking about you know, your patients and how um, you can just kind of see them transform and you know, their jaws start to kind of slack a little bit and their shoulders slump. Have you seen, um, have you observed any interesting patterns as of late and when i say as of late i guess i mean maybe since the, the start of the pandemic um have you seen have you noticed like an uptick in new clientele are you addressing or treating any issues that are a little bit more novel in your space that you hadn't really done before um have you seen any sorry there's a lot of questions <laughs> have you seen any long haulers you know seek relief for chronic pain um, I have seen a couple things, uh, increase. I would say we, we normally see a lot of people that, that struggle with anxiety, but I would say even people that, that didn't have it before I'm seeing more anxiety just to kind of across age groups, across, across, um, uh, people, people who are not really expecting to be feeling anxious or more anxious. Um, I do have um, some people who have been um, long haulers and actually pain hasn't been so much a, an issue for those folks, but sensory changes like um, the loss of smell of and smell and taste sensation can drag out for a long time for some people. Uh, vertigo can be an issue. 
and also just extreme fatigue um, for a really, really long time. Um, and th those are all associated with some of the, the neurological damage that happens with COVID. The th the, I mean, we're all used to sort of thinking about it as this respiratory disease, but it, it affects multiple systems in the body. And that, that symptom of losing your sense of taste and smell, that's damage to one of your cranial nerves. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty significant thing to have swelling in tissue that's coming off of your brainstem. Um, and um, oftentimes when those nerves have been damaged, um, and it's, it's likely a, an inflammatory response, but I, I find it disturbing that the virus is actually getting into that tissue at all. Um, but um, it can take a, quite a while for that to recover. Um, but uh, people are recovering. Um, I haven't seen anybody with with really severe long haul symptoms, but I've I've definitely everybody I've worked with that's had it um, uh, continues to report fatigue. That's probably the the chief thing. Um, well, I think we won't know for a long time what all the really long term repercussions of it are. I think we're uh, medicine's really kind of learning in real time about it. There's there's still lots of questions we don't know about. Right, right. It's still an emerging kind of phenomenon. Um, and it sounds like we're still learning about vaccinated people um, becoming long haulers as well. But, we mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but Sarah, you were listing off the side effects, the, um, the extreme fatigue, the vertigo, the, the sensory changes, the loss of taste, the loss of smell. Are, does massage therapy actually help with some of that? Because it helps with... Um. Indirectly, inflammatory issue. Um, you know, massage has very generalized effects. There haven't hasn't been a lot of research about um, massage on generalized inflammation. Like we don't really we don't really know for certain what it does. Um, and um, so I I don't go around saying oh we can reduce your inflammation with massage because we don't know. Um, what we do know is that we're changing um, a lot of things hormonally, and that can help the body get to a place where it downregulates um, things on its own. Um, but uh, some types of massage can can address um, soft tissue tension around the cranial nerves, um, and um, help with just supporting that tissue to heal itself. Um, I'm a, I have an advanced cranial sacral practitioner, um, which is one of my hats as a, a soft tissue therapist. And there's a lot of work in and around the brain and spinal cord in that work. And, and we can certainly help with, with some of that kind of inflammatory process just by relieving um, pressure of soft tissue around the, those nerve structures. Uh, acupuncture is also really good for some of those kinds of um, sensory nerve tissue um, uh, irritations. Um, but um, yeah, it's mostly, I would say something that's, a, that's about getting better blood flow around particular nerve pathways. Um, and Certainly that's, that's very possible with soft tissue body work. Wonderful. I, um, that reminds me, Sarah, I'd love to talk to you if time willing, um, at some point, a little bit more about craniosacral therapy, because I, there are so many sufferers of regular headaches and migraine, and this is a great tool in your toolbox. Um, oh, it, one of my chief ones, I, I would love to do a Wellness Wednesday at some point just on that, if you'd like, great. sometime in the future. Yeah. Like you're thinking, um, that article, we did an article, I think it was with Amy Horton, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, it, it did, it performed really well. I think that's just such a commonality, of, I mean, for populations across the board. Um, and it's a form of chronic pain. So um, thank you for sharing all that, Sarah, your observations and kind of the indirect, but kind of direct ways in which massage can help with 
know, maintaining sort of optimal health in terms of improving circulation and nerve pathways. Um, Michelle, are you still with us? I, I you okay. can hear me. I don't know what actually happened. It just kind of went off, but I'll hit this again. There we go. I should be back. <laughs> Sounds it just doesn't like to stay on the whole time. <laughs> That's okay. That's quite all right. This is not a formal thing by any means. We're just chilling. We're just here to listen and to be um, uh, awash with your knowledge. My next question for you, Michelle, is um, it's been said, it's been printed, it's been studied that chiropractic care can actually encourage um, our spinal health. And I wanted you to if any, if you could share the ways in which our immune system is actually like related or connected to our spine. Sure, I can. Um, and maybe just stepping back to what I was saying before with the changes in the hormones. So with touch and working on people, triggering those receptors to go and, and signal the brain to start sending messages to trigger more hormones. And like I said, we'll get eventually to the good hormones. Those good hormones not only just uh, allow us to feel good temporarily, but they also allow us to reduce stress. And we do that by reducing or managing, I shouldn't say necessarily reducing, but managing cortisol levels within the body. It's a very huge problem. and what can happen with cortisol levels being too high is that we can gain weight, we can have be depressed, we can have um, heart issues. Long-term, there can be uh, asthma, we can develop, I'm trying to think of a few other things, diabetes, oh, type two tongue, diabetes. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of things that long-term stress will create and the build up of that. And that is kind of what I think I'm seeing a lot now. It isn't, everybody has stress and we, you know, it, there's good stressors and there's bad stressors, but the body doesn't necessarily know which one is which. So when we get excited or fearful, or we're just like overwhelmed, that's when our cortisol levels rise. And that's the type of cortisol levels uh, raising that we don't want to have. So through that process, that's we with all these hormones changing and through touch, it helps us start to manage that cortisol. And what's cool about that is that people can start to see those improvements fairly quick. Uh, a couple of the other things, cortisol, because it is that fast going adrenaline type of feeling, it really causes a lot of problems with sleep, a lot of insomnia, and we can start to see improved sleep too. One of the probably the coolest things I see after adjusting people, because I love to tell them, you're probably going to get the best night's sleep tonight than you've had in a really long time, because it does release all of these types of uh, things that promote our health and well-being. And that's kind of where it goes into indirectly boosting, or our thoughts are boosting the immune system. Uh, because what happens with stress, our immune system drops. And our capabilities of managing uh, other things that are going on in the world, it really it gets reduced. And then at a certain point, we just can't really handle much more stress. And I see that with uh, patients a lot more, a lot more stressed out. Uh, worry long term is what has everybody concerned right now with this pandemic because we really need to be looking at depression, anxiety, insomnia. One of the things I explain to people as well, if you're healing and we are triggering rebuilding a muscle and we want restoring your activity level so that we all know if you get exercise more, that also increases serotonin and that is also going to make you feel better. So instead of maybe feeling so socially isolated, you actually are doing things to offset that. So um, I think there's just so many avenues. And I, uh, like I said, I did go down the rabbit hole, but I was like, you know, at this topic, you could probably teach a week on, and we don't even know uh, the a touch of what the pandemic is causing and what it's going to do. Because we also have, it isn't just like middle-aged people or people who lost jobs. It is everybody from our young kids who couldn't go to school 
couldn't play with their friends in the isolation. Uh, my daughter alone, three years it involved from fourth grade where they closed school to fifth grade where it changed uh, the program seven different times to being done and then not starting on time after. So it's just been, it's just involving everything. Sixth grade started school, but they have to wear masks. <laughs> and of course, I mean, I wouldn't want it any other way, but uh, it's just never ending. And I think we don't know, um, excuse me, I can just grab a little water here. Mm -hmm. But it's disrupting routine and that, you know, that impacts the younger change. Children. I mean, I was, change is hard when I was a kid and I was just such a nervous kid. I don't think I'd be able to like deal just going to school was enough. But then for, yeah, for the constant, you know, the, the touch and go and the starts yeah. and stops. It's yeah, that's a lot for a little person. It is. And so you're going to have all kinds of varying degrees yeah. of how we're going to have to manage that and help them down the road and catch them up or uh, not make it so stressful. Because you're right. 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 That is the big thing. We make it so stressful and it's already stressful. Yeah. Um, so but, I do think we have a lot, a lot of work to do. That's for yeah. sure. But I love it. I, it's, it's fantastic. And um, I really enjoy having people come in, new people come in more people come in uh it's sad to see that we don't maybe get quite the results that we used to as quick but that's to be expected this long-term stress is just one of those things it's very detrimental to people yeah uh that makes me think we need to do a post on cortisol and how it's kind of become its own public health epidemic and right. ways to manage it um and all the tools that you should have at your disposal um, thanks for that, Michelle. Sarah, my next question is for you. I, um, what got me thinking about this question, I was actually in and saw um, Jessica Maynard. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're familiar with her, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. Yeah. So, I Jessica. Yeah. And um, so she's been my acupuncturist for the past couple of years. And I went and saw her and my gut health just felt very off and I felt very, I mean, I'm a new mom. So like just naturally I'm tired all the time, but like on a new level, like actual, like I felt zombified and I was like, please help. Am I dying? Anyways. Um, so she, you know, she did her thing and it was so interesting to me how certain needles, I couldn't feel a thing and others. I was like, Ooh, you know, there was just that little, like that little, uh, mm -hmm. electric current that kind of runs down your body where you're like, well, oh, like you got stung, um, uh -huh. obviously not long lasting. It's a very fleeting sensation for those of you who have had acupuncture, you probably know what I'm talking about, but all that to say that I felt so much better, even that later that day, I drank a lot of water. I slept so well. Um, and I felt like I had just a better level of energy to carry me through the weekend. And so I just wanted to know and again, I know that we're not making claim that any of these modalities are a fix for immune support issues. And I think we really want to make that clear for people that these are supportive tools um, that you should definitely look into and, and, and try. Um, but all that to say, Sarah, which acupressure points on the body are, um, would you label as, I guess, vital for immune support? Um, well, it's one I, there's one particular point that um, actually has been researched actually in um, uh, cancer patients. Um, and we actually know that it does seem to help with specific uh, levels of immune cells, like with some white blood cells. But uh, there's a, a point on the shin, actually. It's one of my favorite points. It's stomach 36. Um, and it's just about the width of your hand um, below your, the bottom edge of your kneecap um, and kind of just in the middle of the shin muscle. Um, there's a pretty big acupuncture point, probably the you know, size of a nickel. So it's pretty easy to find for, I always teach um, uh, patients how to, how to work on it. Um, it has many sort of special properties as an acupuncture point. Um, and one of its jobs is it has really strong influence over the abdomen and um, 
uh, stomach and intestines, all, all of the digestive organs. Um, and from a Western standpoint, we, we know that there's an enormous amount of um, uh, the immune system located in your gut. You have lymph vessels and lymphocytes are your white blood cells. And the lymph system um, is one of the places where lymphocytes travel through your body. And um, they're just everywhere in your gut all through your intestines. And so anything that we do that supports your gut really, really, really helps um, the immune system kind of indirectly because the better your um, intestines and stomach are working, the better that immune system is gonna be working. Um, and sometimes that's even just like, say your, your um, digestion's really slow and it feels like food's just sitting in, in your intestines and not moving through. If we can get that to move through, that helps your system not be having to deal with um, nearly as, as much um, irritation because um, you'll start to get some sort of inflammatory processes. And if, if the, that, all those lymph vessels in your gut don't have to deal with inflammation, they're, they're, they can be fighting off viruses better. Um, so it's sort of an indirect effect, but um, very, very important. Um, Sarah, Rachel wants to know if you could demonstrate where exactly that spot is. Oh, let's see how great this, this, um, uh, <laughs> see if we can get, can we get my leg up here? I don't know if I can get my leg on camera. She wants to know. <laughs> Yeah, where, the, she said where that spot is on the abdomen, but I think she means... Oh, it's it's on your shin. It's on your leg. On the shin and the shin muscle, you said, and it's... it's okay, so fi everybody find your knee... Mo most people can find their kneecap, right? Yeah. No, she got her kneecap. That is. Okay, and you want to take, take your hand like this. So this width between your four fingers... It, you can use to measure from the bottom of your kneecap. Okay. Um, and then you're going to be right on a bony part of your shin right there, right? Yep. So you're going to come off that bony bit um, about the width of your index finger, and then you're in muscle tissue right there. So the muscly part of the shin, that spot, mm. that's stomach 36. Stomach 36, Okay. Awesome. It's on the stomach meridian. And I feel like, is that one of the ones that can um, have more of a tendency to like, you feel it? Cause I feel like oh, it has a fairly strong sensation for a lot of people. Yeah. And it almost your leg feels, or at least my calf has felt sore. Sometimes. Yeah. It feels a little sore. That's only during the session, but not after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Thanks for demonstrating that for us, Sarah. We have another um, question here for either of you two ladies. And this one says, my mom has ovarian cancer. I'm so sorry, Sarah. Uh, her name is Sarah. My mom has ovarian cancer and is about to start her third round of chemo next week. Could she be getting acupuncture while going through chemo? That's a wonderful question. Yes. Um, we often treat people while they're going through chemo and sometimes when they're doing radiation too. Um, it can really help with um, energy um, and it can help with some of the side effects of the chemo. So people often have, have nausea um, and fatigue and actually stomach 36 is a fantastic acupuncture point for people when they're going through that. The, one of the other side effects. Sarah, is, is stomach 36 on one shin or is that on? You, you On each shin. You, so you have two of them. Okay. Sorry. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. All of, all of the, bio, uh, many, many acupuncture points. Um, there's two of each. So they're, they're on, uh, there's a right one and a left one. Um, and, um, but with cancer uh, therapies, uh, one of the common side effects of a lot of chemotherapeutics um, because they're trying to, to cut off blood supply a lot of times to um, tumor tissue, it cuts off blood supply to other parts of the body, unfortunately. Um, and so people develop um, what's called peripheral neuropathy, and it usually shows up in the feet, and people start to, to develop numbness and um, 
uh, kind of odd sensations like like tingling um, or burning sensation. And it's because those tiny, tiny little sensory nerves are, are essentially getting starved because of the effects of that medication. And um, if you start um, acupuncture while you're getting um, chemotherapy, sometimes that, that at least can be lessened that, that we can try to kind of help um, promote circulation to those tiny, tiny little blood um, nerve tissue uh, in the foot. And that can, can at least make it less um, uncomfortable. Um, we may not be able to save the sen sensation, but we can at least keep it from hurting and, or, and tingling. Um, Thanks for sharing, Sarah. And Sarah, we're wishing you and your mama all our best. Um, and I just say that too, Sarah, I really do. And I can, my heart goes out to you. My mother had the same type of cancer. So I really can understand what she's been going through and what you and your family have been going through. So, uh, but definitely there's more, we need more studies. There's no question for complementary and alternative medicine, but there's so much like Sarah was saying too, that shows how that affects and helps cancer patients. So definitely I would use all of them <laughs> to have her do everything. Massage, yeah. chiropractic, uh, acupuncture, uh, supplements, you name it. Sending you all of our love, Sarah. Um, my question for you, uh, Michelle, I wanted to know, so we've got about 10 minutes on the clock here. Mm -hmm. um, lower back pain is something that seems to be as prevalent as ever with so many of us. I mean, many of us are going back into the office, but either way, even if we are working from home or we're in the office, um, by nature, some of us have um, jobs that kind of keep us more sedentary just by the nature of the role during the day. And so uh, obviously that can lead to, you know, chronic pain in the lower back. Um, I think a lot of us have just come to accept it. Um, so I want to know at what point should we actually be worried about it? And when is it serious enough for someone to kind of inquire or, um, seek medical attention for that? Absolutely. And it's a great question because you're right. Low back pain is probably the number one debilitating condition that keeps people from working or um, if they do have care that's even more serious, like surgeries, a lot of times they aren't able to get back to their activity level that they were at before. So it really involves, there's a lot of stress and strain, I'd say on our regular healthcare system, uh, but it's, it's one of those questions people never know what to do. Sometimes it's dull and it'll come and go. And it's your body's way of saying, okay, something's not quite right here. You're either it's your ergonomics, like you said, that was a big, huge factor with people working from home. We're mobile. We have a lot of joints in the body. And so we want actually, the body wants to be up and it wants to be moving, not to the point of exhaustion, but it doesn't want to sit for eight hours either, because then it starts to forget what it's really designed to do muscles start to change their tone and length and strength by not moving and using them. It's kind of that, you know, uh, use it or lose it type of philosophy. So I usually will say, if it starts to interfere with your life or lifestyle and you're not able to do certain things, it's probably a little bit already, you should have been in sooner just because there's so, it'll be quicker fix to get you right back in track and to get back to your daily life. When it gets high pain levels, uh, we use a scale usually like a zero to 10, 10 being the absolute worst pain and zero, no pain at all. If you're in a constant or a pretty, you know, half the day pain type of thing at uh, a six or a seven, you should really be seen. Um, if you've never had chiropractic care, we have already shown in studies that that is the first round to go to as far as a remedy or a treatment. And so most doctors even will send most of their patients, if you go in, say it's urgent care, they'll send them to a chiropractor, orthopedics too. If they've never ever had chiropractic care, they'll send them to the chiropractor too to see if that will resolve it. Uh, some back pain will resolve in six weeks. We know studies of that as well. Uh, 
my concern with that is, is that there's a reason it started. And even though it might go away, doesn't mean it won't come back. Uh, the thing is, is if we haven't looked at it and we haven't fixed it, odds are it is easily going to come back, especially with people's activity level, uh, sports, overuse injuries. Uh, you know, we, we just overdo so many things, workouts, and a lot of stuff, to be really honest with you, Jamie, starts when we're young, <laughs> not lifting properly, not learning that we should go in when something hurts. Kids are so resilient. So you know what? It hurts horrible, right? One day, the next day, oh, I'm, I'm great. I'm back at it. So we need to have a little bit more of that. Okay, the first time I feel it, I'm going to go in. And it's hard to, uh, men sometimes block their pain. They kind of just like, they don't want to listen to it or hear it or whatever. And they can kind of put up a really good compartmentalized wall of not feeling things. Sure. Women, on the other hand, we keep, doing <laughs> instead of going in and taking care of ourselves and, and checking things and fixing that we're taking care of everybody and so we just push through and that's a lot of reasons too why we see more with the low back but there's so much you can do uh, there's general uh, wear and tear we're going to have that we expect that joint spaces are going to narrow it wouldn't be it, it it's just a normal process like osteoarthritis. It sounds like a scary thing, but it really is what we expect as we get older and the more we use our joints. So hopefully that answers a little bit better. Oh, yeah, that answered a, a lot of it. Um, uh, and I just want to say, <laughs> I have a testimonial. I had a really bad um, SI joint issue. Lisa, if you're watching this, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's my boss. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt, I mean, I could barely walk and I'm someone who's like, oh, I'll work through it. You know, a typical woman. And anyways, I went to a chiropractor and he worked on me twice. The first, he worked on me once. And after that, again, I probably overdid it. I walked three miles home after he fixed me because I felt that good. Um, and then I saw him one more time, I think four weeks later. And after that, it was, I mean, I haven't had any issues since then. So, um, I was a little shy about trying chiropractic care, but you know, North people at Northwestern and my colleagues were all big advocates for it. And um, yeah, I will shout it from the rooftops whenever I can. It was just like acupuncture massage therapy. I mean, these are just a, amazing, amazing modalities. Um, Sarah, Natalie has a question for you and she wants to know for chronic headaches, so daily slash weekly in every headache category, are there any mm. pressure points for relief? That's a really good question. And also I wonder if she would be a good candidate for craniosacral uh, therapy. Might very well be. Um, well, it depends a little bit on location of the headache. Um, so the, you, usually when I'm working with people with headaches, I wanna find out about like, where do people typically um, feel them? So for, for temporal headaches that are here, you have a, a really big chewing muscle on the side of your head. It's called the temporalis muscle. And it's filling in this space above your ears, um, a big thick muscle. If you clench your teeth when you're touching that side of your head, you'll feel it contract. But it's tendons, I'm gonna take my glasses off so you can see, kind of come down by your cheekbone here and go into the, the joints here. So this, this whole sort of temporal area that can get really sore by next to your eye is a really good place to, to massage. And like what I'm doing right here, where I'm, I'm just using two fingers and I'm just sort of pressing in and I'm, I'm just rotating the tissue that around. You can do that and you don't have to do very much pressure because sometimes you'll find like really tender spots through that area and you can you can follow the muscle along if you start by your eye and kind of move back even to above your ear here or kind of up up in this area here. It, I did mention it's a big muscle. It's big fan shaped muscle. Um, any of those tender spots are really nice to work on. So you can kind of just move around around that whole side of your head and temporal area and right next to your eyes. Um, that can be really relieving. Um, a lot of folks with uh, pretty much every single type of headache I see, even migraine, um, people come in and they're like, oh, I carry all my stress right here. And they're pointing to their upper trapezius muscles in the, in the shoulder. Um, this is, I joke that this muscle pays my mortgage. Um, 
but you can also get trigger points in this area that, that refer sensation up into the head and people will get headache um, from it back in here and then it'll wrap into the temporal area. So actually squeezing your upper trapezius in any of the places where it feels um, tender is really helpful. Um, but just, just those two things alone can help with a lot of types of headaches. Um, awesome. I don't know, does that answer the question well enough? I am guess, yeah, I am, it sounded okay. good. <laughs> I, I didn't ask it, but it sounded good to me. Uh, let's see here. Oh, Natalie said, yes, that's great. Thank you. So we have two minutes to spare. Um, do either of you want to add anything to the conversation that we haven't touched on quite yet or have any closing remarks? Um, other than just, we're obviously so grateful for your presence and for making the time for today. I feel so fortunate to be alongside of you too. I've sourced you for various articles in the past and it's just so great to always put a face to the name. Sarah, I, I, I think I've, maybe I've seen you at a health makers in the past. Oh, yes. You look yeah. familiar too. Thank um, you very like, much. Oh, That's very God. kind. Yes. And you too are just so ridiculously smart. It's just <laughs> Woo, women. Um, oh, wait, there's one quick question here. I af I often do the trap squeeze when I have shoulder pain. Do you recommend Jaku, did I say that right? Or Theraguns for use as an at-home massager? Oh, you know, um, I'm not sure. I'd have to Google what those look like. Or is one of them like a Theracane? No, I think they are like more sort of like these new, uh, they're the new massagers, I think. They come with, okay. uh, it looks almost like a hairdryer. So if you're like a hairdryer for blowing your hair dry after a shower, like that shape. And then there's like okay. probably four or five attachments. And they have gotten to be the very in thing. And they Oh, so they're the, the new hot in thing. It is. And I use them daily in my practice. Uh, they're a little bit stronger and I can vary the intensity a lot okay. more. Typically, things that people buy at home tend not to go overboard just so they don't hurt themselves. And that's uh, I'm glad that that happens. But uh -huh. I would say I have so many patients that tell me that have bought these that they love them. They can have somebody else do like the back of their leg, their, you know, wherever they're sore, their glute muscles, if they've been ran and they're tight and they're feeling all kinds of different things or their low back like we've talked about uh, the traps you're right the uh -huh. traps and the and i see it in the back of course like all the neck muscles uh, the flexors neck flexors in our world of like texting and gaming and we've always got our head down like that so we're doing a lot of strain on those they can use these different attachment sites so um, as long as you're not overdoing it you know, because you can make yourself too sore and you just play with the intensity. I would personally say, yeah, I think the Theragun is awesome. Wonderful. Ah, Theragun. Okay, I'll definitely have to look that one up. <laughs> There's a Hypervolt. Um, we have a backhammer. They okay. all have their own names. Yeah. Jennifer adds, they're, uh -huh. char they're charged up. They um, and they have multiple attachments. So like, a, yeah, those are, you know, I'm a big fan of lots of, of the, the, the kind of, the come out new self massage tools all the time. Um, and they're all helpful. Um, I think if you find one that you're like, wow, you know, that feels good. Remember what, what Michelle was saying about that what's happening in your biochemistry when you get that feel good sensation from touch that mm -hmm. like if the pharmaceutical companies could bottle that right there, right. you know, your body is, is producing all these great biochemicals that are pain relieving, that are relaxing. So if it feels good, if you're like, Oh, ah, um, <laughs> you know, it's a good tool. Go ahead and use it. Right, right. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> The body knows. Um, thanks so mm -hmm. much, Sarah and Michelle. You two are such shining gems. Um, just appreciate you coming on today and, and talking to all of us. Thank and Sarah, I think I'll have to take you up on a, a future craniosacral session. Because Absolutely. 
it's just it's so cool i i feel like it just it warrants so much more attention in um in the medical space because so many of us suffer from chronic head issues head mm -hmm. pain um so with that it is um it's end time <laughs> and Hopefully, um, those of you who have joined us, you'll be back next month, um, October 20th, I believe. October 20th, just double checking. Yes, um, we have a session called It's Not All in Your Head, It's Hormones. That's gonna be extremely insightful, especially for women. And we'll be talking about how we're all dealing with various levels of fluctuation when it comes to our hormones and how they happen to hold a lot more well, as we talked about in today's episode, a lot more power in influence over our uh, physiology than we than we actually realize. Um, that's it for today. Thanks Katie, so much. Thank you so me. much. It was you such an back. honor to be here. Thanks oh, for asking. Thank you. I'm so glad the video worked out, Michelle. <laughs> yes, me too. That's yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right, you guys all take care. Thanks. Thank right. you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>